already. So my title's Gradle Modules, which I was saying earlier is pretty terrible because it probably should be something better than that. But I actually read the thing that David put on the Meetup page or whoever did that. And it was actually a lot better than just Gradle Modules. So <laughs> I didn't actually paste it here. I should have. Um, all right, so what are we talking about? Uh, if anybody's familiar with the Android Studio pane, you have generally just like an app there, I think is what's generated by default. Um, so a couple ones here, like locations, login, network, preferences. Um, so there's ways to organize your application. Uh, that's basically what we're talking about. A couple of the popular ones are by feature and by layer. So by feature would be something like for a login screen for, I work at a banking company, so we'll use that example for like the ATM location screen for your accounts, for your transactions. That'd be examples for by feature. And by layer would be something like uh, the networking layer or the preferences layer, or maybe you have like, I don't know, some other thing that you need kind of utilities wise that's used all over and everywhere. Then you kind of have both. So some people kind of promote like we're going to have our accounts page and then we'll have the views for that. We'll have the presenters or view models or whatever your architecture is and then so on and so forth. So you could kind of think about it as a grid and have your features be columns and your layers be rows and you know kind of choose your poison how you want to organize things. So that's the the general thing. Anybody have any questions like already? Sure. Sorry. Uh, so just looking at that, like normally how I organize like packages is usually like would maybe put all of your pages in a package or something like that. Do you find this confusing to not know what is a page versus or what is a feature versus network? Like preferences could be a page or it could be shared preferences. Yeah. Like uh, as a like. You, sure. Did, like, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I suppose if you work on the code long enough, you'll figure it out. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. So kind of like what's popularized this topic in general is Android Instant Apps, which was, I think, announced two IOs ago, if I'm not mistaken. And basically what it allows you to do is go to Google and say, give me some pizza, and you can click a link for pizza and it takes you to the Pizza Hut app, and you just go to their actual native app, not their website, and you don't have to go to the Google Play Store and download anything. You just get the native experience through, whether it's an email link, a text message, or just searching Google. But there's a lot of other really awesome benefits for it. so. I'll list a few here, but decoupled architecture. So like I kind of listed out before, you might have your features decoupled. You might have your architecture layers decoupled. And there's benefits to that. Um, Android Gradle plugin 3.0 has like some pretty significant performance improvements for doing these multiple Gradle modules. And Gradle itself, I think 4.0 was a pretty big change with how they do um, compile avoidance. So if you don't change something in a module, then that module doesn't need to be recompiled or any of its transitive dependencies. So you can get some pretty awesome performance ones there, which makes me happy. Um, you can also test in isolation. So maybe you care about your networking layer and testing that, and you don't care if the accounts page works like just kind of separating your concerns and testing the things in isolation. And maybe you have like your accounts page and you want to make sure that works, but you're building some new feature and you want to test that. But oh, when we added this one, we want to make sure we didn't break this other one. So you can kind of like make sure that you test the things that make sense to test together. And you can always do functional testing. So like if you want to do end to end or something like that, you can always put that here, this kind of just enforces it at the build system level. So at my company, we do 
some pretty, like, I'll call it hacky, but we'll, we'll call it fancy, um, build logic. So we have multiple, we call it RDC, Remote Deposit Capture, which basically means I'm going to take a picture of a check and it's going to get deposited into my account. Well, there's multiple ways to do that, and that's not like our area of expertise. And so we have like a very basic one for testing that all it does is take a picture and assume it's valid. But there's super fancy ones that'll like correct the aspect ratio of them and like make sure it's a valid check and it has the right numbers on it and stuff like that. So there's well, a middle range that gets confused by the security ink that's on there and says this isn't a check I can, I can verify. Yeah, so they do endless, endless, endless things with that. But what we can do because of that is like in our debug builds, we can build just this check is valid every time. And in release builds, we actually go through and use that remote deposit capture provider that does all of that extra stuff. And we just include those based on a flag. So you can kind of switch out the implementations that way. So there are some drawbacks, and I moved one of my open source projects over to kind of this architecture, and it is more code. So there is some boilerplate there, and removing these cyclic and transitive dependencies is hard. And so Gradle won't let you have a cyclic dependency. And what that means is I have my app module, and I have my accounts module, and I have my transactions module. Well, I can't have the app depend on accounts and accounts depend on trans or the app because that's basically causing a cycle. So it doesn't know how to compile the whole thing because it's like, I need that to be compiled. I need that to be compiled. So removing that is hard. And then say when you're on your account screen, you need to go to the transaction screen when you click an account. That's transitive dependency now. So like, how do you remove that? Because in order to get the real performance wins through Gradle, the transitive, the tree needs to be really fat, not really tall. Um, and then the other thing is just like composite functionality. So the biggest example I know of here is just like creating a menu. So if you have like a crazy build system where some modules are included once in a while and maybe not all the time or you just want like automatic registration of something. So say your menu has accounts, ATM locations, and those are in separate modules. Like how do you make those automatically get registered here? Where before you might use like a dagger into set binding. Well, you can't do that across modules. Or if you do, you have to like register your module, your dagger module. So. Uh, that can be kind of difficult. So there's a couple ways to reduce boilerplate, and this here is in Gradle itself. So basically what I do in my projects is I just have the Android Gradle plugin is like just copy and paste it between every module. So rather than doing that, I just set it up in the root build.gradle, and it basically sets all the defaults for the Android Gradle plugin. And that might look something like this. So you might be setting like the compile SDK version or the build tools version or the min SDK. Um, and you can do all that for every project. So they're all consistent. And that is really helpful when you want to go change any one of these things or add a new one or something like that. So that can help there. Um, and as I kind of listed out here, you can do that with many more things like check style or Kotlin or anything that you have it so you can kind of apply that idea. So probably like the hardest part to conceive about splitting your app into these modules is how do we remove these cyclic slash transitive dependencies. And the best way that I've found is to use interfaces. So what this is, is when we're logged in, all we know is that this page is done now. Like the the authentication page shouldn't know where to go next. Like, who cares about that, right? So what do we do? We just delegate that. So we make a navigator interface, and then somebody else handles that, probably in your app module. Because in testing, 
you know, you might want to do something different, or maybe you have a debug variant that just skips the auth page entirely, or something like that. So basically, rather than having the auth page depend on, say, the dashboard, you just have the auth page, the auth Gradle module define this interface. And then when you actually instantiate the screen for auth, you just pass this in or use Dagger to provide it or some way to get that dependency to that screen. And then once that screen's done, you just say, hey, I'm authenticated. And whatever your like navigation mechanism is, whether that's fragments or activities or something else, um, you just say, go do your thing and it'll take you to the dashboard there. That way you're kind of removing that knowledge that when you actually think about it as like a pragmatic programmer, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. The auth page really shouldn't know that the dashboard's next. Um, so that kind of works with cyclic and transitive dependencies. Um, there's a lot to it. You'll run into issues here, guaranteed, like I said before. Um, so this compositing idea, I this was another like big contention point when I wanted to move to this style of architecture. So in Kotlin, there's this thing called expect and actual, and what it's actually meant for is cross-platform stuff. So like in your pure Kotlin module, you'd say expect some view, and on Android, you would have the actual view and in JavaScript, you'd have the actual view that's based on that platform. And basically the compiler just links everything up magically at build time. Does this actually work for this use case? I don't know, I haven't yet to try it. It's still experimental and like kind of a pain in the butt to use. Um, but I did, there's a library called Glide, which is like an image loading library and they do some pretty awesome annotation processing code generation hacks. And I basically took their method and just wrote a generic version. And now you can use it with any project, whether it's Glide or setting up your menu from multiple modules. Um, so I'm not really gonna talk about that, but we definitely will have time at the end that I'll let you guys kind of decide what we wanna do with. So. If this is something that people are interested, um, totally bring it back up. All right, so to the good parts now. Um, instant apps, what are they? I kind of mentioned this earlier, but it requires some things to happen in order to make it work. So the idea is that it's instant, right? So when you click a link, like you want the app just to show up like it was always on your phone. Well, in order to do that, you kind of need a really small APK that can be downloaded really fast. And there's also, in instant apps, you can have like a base APK so that like that's the core of what you need. And then you can have multiple features. So like for Pizza Hut, for example, you might have one that's like the checkout flow where all you're going to do is pay for your pizza. And you might have another flow that's like the takeout, I think is what it's called, yeah, where you actually want to choose a location and go pick it up rather than have it delivered. And maybe those are too similar, maybe they're different, maybe you just want to find the location or something. And you can, you can think of use cases where you'd need kind of that architecture broken up in a way that makes that work. Um, I haven't done a ton of research or actually implemented anything with instant apps. So this is kind of like, hey, it's nice, this helps with that, but I have no idea how to actually do that. So maybe that's a good idea for another talk. So is, would you have the architecture act any different if you had a base uh, APK versus um, you know, the library? Uh, you know, basically, is it, is it, do you have the re-architecture -architect, app specifically for <coughs> a base APK? So, there's a couple things, and again, I haven't actually done this, so like this is just from like my glazed of reading. But there's feature, like so normally you have like a library when you declare a new Gradle module, you say Android library. There's also a feature, and then I think there's a third one for that 
base one. Um, could be totally wrong here. Maybe it's just like a property in the Gradle config. Um, but you do have to architect it in a way that would work towards that. And this is definitely in that direction. I can't say it works perfectly because I haven't done it. Um, but again, I think that's a good idea for another, <laughs> another talk. All right, so kind of like why I really wanted to do this was for the decoupled architecture. And in past jobs, it's been really, really, really annoying to have a new feature break an existing feature. And so like when you can have the build system like force you to think about things in a way that separates these features that don't really need to know about each other, and you can have like these really well-defined lines between the features. So like obviously your app is going to have to work together, but now you have like these very clear separations. And I think this is like the biggest win of all for this. So I don't really have like a good example, but totally would love to talk about this, especially if you guys have questions. So if you do, let me know. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the biggest thing, another great advantage is the build times. And, you know, you can get some of these things with just upgrading to these. But if you architect your app in this way, you will have very large code bases with very low build times, which makes developers happy. So kind of going on the decoupled architecture also goes with testing and isolation. So you can actually test like one screen in a flow in isolation and not have to like test your whole app. Um, the app that I had in open source that I did this on is a great example of this. Like I had no way to break these up to test these screens in isolation before. And now I do. And so like before the test was like, you know, one test, test all the things, which, you know, provides value. But if you can validate these individual features on their own, you can get faster feedback because you're only compiling the tests for this module and the code for this module. And you can also like actually do TDD even with UD UI tests. Um, so the feedback loop is, is a lot tighter and actually makes writing code faster. Um, and again, like this whole thing is not necessarily easy, but I can tell you from experience that doing this makes writing new code easier, faster, more enjoyable. And you can, because of this, basically prevent regressions. Uh, I kind of talked about the flexible builds earlier too. Um, another good question point, if anybody has any ideas for that. Um, so now I'm kind of like done with slides. Like this is my basic idea and I was hoping that you guys would have questions um, and maybe guide me where I should go. I have an open source project with this idea done. We can do it over again. We can create a new module or move one over to this architecture. So I was kind of hoping to lean on you guys for what you wanted. What's up, Brandon? <laughs> How do you handle styles and resources between feature modules? Do you just have like one directory that you add, or do you have that as its own module that every project compiles? All right, that's a good question. So, um, uh, that's not the right project. So this is an open source project that I have. Um, yeah, I was wondering why that was taking so long. Uh, and basically the question is, how do you organize styles and resources in general? So the important ones are like the global ones, right? So for instance, you might have something like an application theme, and you might have something like all of my text views are styled one way, and that's like 
and the application theme, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to switch branches here, maybe. Actually, oh, here we go. So the best way to do it is a lot of times you don't actually need those themes, styles defined in the native child modules because they just work the way the context works at runtime. Um, but if you do need that, basically what I've done is define like, for instance, you might have like a positive button and a negative button theme or something like that and you want to use that. Um, so here I kind of have like a base module, which is kind of like the architectures type stuff of the app. And this just has like some classes, but you can also put stuff like strings or styles or whatever. And I was just lazy when I was doing this. So I just threw all the strings in here and they'll get transitively dependent where they need to be. So everything just works. I basically just moved them from app to a module and then every module just imports that basically. So, yeah. So, like, for instance, right now the way this is done is there's only one module broken out. And basically, this one has a dependency on this base project, on this base module. And the app also has a dependency on this. So here, we also have a dependency on it. Um, and basically, I just put it in that, just promote the, the things up that you need to do. Yep. So you just kind of promote things as you need them. Is basically the pattern that I've done. Nope. Everything works perfectly. I mean, and the thing is, like with the uh, interfaces, for example, some might say that, like. Um, like the actual place this is used in code is like, what does this actually do, right? But you just command click and then you can get to the implementation on what it actually does by just clicking through to the thing that implements it. So it's a it's a layer of indirection, so you might have to click one or two more times, but all the command click stuff just works. Yeah. Yo. Yep. Yeah, so basically all of these, the what Gradle is doing is generating an AAR out of these. And it's just a mono repo or a monolithic repo. So rather than like uploading each individual feature or layer or whatever, um, it's basically just one repository and so all the code's in one place and you can just click through to it. So like this module here that I called third screen because this is like, I can show you the app actually. Um, basically this is the first screen as it's labeled and you can click a button to go to the second one and you can click a button to go to the third one. So, you know, <laughs> it's just basically meaningless but that's what it is. But the way that this is built, it actually generates an AAR. So if you go to the build and generated and outputs it's not actually doing that because of the new Android Gradle plugin. Um, but in essence, that's what it's doing. And like this project here is open source. And this module here is an AAR and gets uploaded to JCenter. And so like it is doing all of that. But in here, it's kind of like all an implementation detail. Just behind the scenes. So, so the idea of having an app that is really pointed to a module, you think? 
Exactly. Yep. So basically what the, so this Gradle plugin here, I'm gonna, I'm not used to having it this big. Um, so right here we're pl applying the plugin for COM Android library. There's also one for COM Android feature. And basically by doing a feature, it's gonna package this as an AAR so that you can use it in your main app and it's also going to package it as an APK so that you can deploy it to the Google Play Store. So it's basically just modifying the outputs to be multiple that you can ship, if you will. Yeah. Um, we don't have like any commands to generate this, but it's actually pretty easy. So like if you go file new, uh, new module, and then you just choose Android library, and then we can try, I don't know. <laughs> hey now. Um, so basically now we have another one called GDG and by default this is generated with tests, um, source code, a manifest, and by default a string with the app name. Um, so you get a couple tests, examples, and then you get ProGuard rules and a build.gradle and basically what it so by default nothing depends on this new module yeah and so like it's built with the rest of the app it's just not the code's not included anywhere so like you'd have to go for instance into our third screens build.gradle and say you could copy something like this to do, uh, we called it GDG, and then it would be included here. Um, but as I was kind of talking about earlier with the boilerplate, is basically by default these generate all this code here. And basically what we specified in the root build.gradle, you can just delete it. So. It makes adding new ones of these kind of like a lot easier. You basically just have to focus on code. I also did all this. Other questions, other interests? Yeah, um, I suppose like any standard Java server side project could do this. You know, not saying that they do or would, but you know, you can build a web project with Gradle too. Um, I don't think anything necessarily promotes this sort of thought, but if you take like a step back and look at other build systems apart from Gradle, like uh, Buck or Blaze. Or Basil, I think is the Google open source one. Um, their whole mindset is built on like, we can build code fast, but in order to do so, you must split your code up. And so basically they build these small units. And like, if you look at the Google repo, supposedly I don't work there, but it's a monolithic repo basically all the code for the entire organization is in one repository and it's stupid huge but you can just reuse code from anywhere because it's organized in a way that makes sense and it's in small chunks and basically the build system enforces that you can't do something wrong then and so you can just do it um, so is there like another framework such as like Android or a platform or something that makes you 
or even encourages it, not that I know of. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Can you show how you, uh, you kind of set in your presentation how you have to set up the interface? Can you show how that's implemented? Yeah. So, this is the third screen navigator. Hmm. That's readable. Um, so, in the presentation, it was Kotlin and the code. This project's all Java, um, so it's in Java. But it's basically just a. The only thing that I really needed, so that I didn't depend on the second screen, was this pop to second screen. Um, and the way that it's implemented is, you know, kind of irrelevant but it requires knowledge of a class that's only available in second screen. But if we go back and we find where this is used, um, other buttons on the same screen might talk to the navigation manager and do different things. This is kind of just like showcasing what this library that I wrote can do, so it's all kind of specific to it. Yeah, so like this screen manager class is in the base, which you can see there. So that's how it works in both the third screen module and the app module. So it's kind of like one, one layer removed. And like this is something that I kind of just like hacked together to show this. So like the screenshot I showed where you have like a little more well-defined things is probably better but this was like promote everything that needs to be in base to base and figure out the details later so this is kind of just like step one to being able to even split a screen apart from everything else I promote you copying and pasting right? like dragging and dropping dragging and dropping yeah so like there's some package renames. I can show you the diff too, um, if you care. Um, but most of it is a lot of package renaming. Some stuff is like, I don't know how to make this work, so I just make new interfaces and just go for it. That's basically what it is, it's just like either drag and drop or create new interface to get this to work. So most of it's just package rename and stuff. Or you know that. Um, so yeah, most of it's just drag and dropping package renames. Um, do you want me to go through the logic from, you know, no separation to one. Do you want to see another one added? Do we want to go home? I, it's kind of up to you guys. Uh, so like I, I already moved this one into its own module. Like, do you want to see the diff and like explained of what that took? Or do you want to see like the second one added? Or what do you guys? So do you want to see the one that's already done, or do you want to see me fumble on live coding? I'm not going to tell you what to do, man. You live your life. <laughs> Either way. You that I heard see. already done? I, I just, live coding never goes wrong. Well. Yeah, I just, I just want to see how, I, just, I just want to see you. You just want to see me fail, I see how it is. Yeah, no, I just, that's not okay. I just want to see how it works. Um, <laughs> I did it. Just so that I could do it in live coding. Because <laughs> I knew if I tried to do it in live coding, I'd run into problems. And guess what I did? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had this idea. And I was like, oh, that'd be a piece of cake. Um, so this is kind of nonsense because we're doing this sort of diff. Um, how do we feel about this sort of diff? Is this okay? All right, so... Let's, let's take a step back here and say what this project is. Uh, this project is like 
to show how one could possibly do a single activity app architecture. So basically there's a couple things um, and it primarily just deals with navigation. So for instance, you might push onto the stack the second screen and you might replace this screen with the second screen. So for instance, we'll do the replace. Now if I click back, if I could actually click back, let's say I have a pop listener that says, do you really want to do what you want to do? And you can click yes. Well, the first screen was gone, so now we have nothing. Uh, if we start over, we can go here, we can click back, and we can say, yeah, we're really sure. We go back to the first screen. Um, you know, we can keep pushing, uh, so on and so forth. So notice we don't have a confirm here. If I go pop two, so it'll try and pop the one before it, it's like, oh, you got locked out here because something stopped you. So you can say confirm. So it's a single activity, it's using views, and it's basically just a navigator. Um, this project has a lot of dagger, and that's mostly it. It uses butter knife and some other things, but mostly just a massive dagger project doing this single activity architecture thing. So um, this here was a file that was moved from the app project into the base project, as you can see here. Um, and basically before, I was using uh, the application just statically to use Leak Canary to watch for leaks on these things to make sure they don't leak. Um, but now that it's in a module outside of the actual app, like I can't reference that anymore. So basically I just created a leak watcher interface that has one method that's like, make sure this object that I pass to you doesn't get leaked and leak canary handles the rest. Um, so that's basically the biggest change here is saying that, you know, we can no longer reference that. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these package info.java, but what I'm using them for is just to say, um, parameters are non-null by default. So basically anything that doesn't have a null, nullable parameter on it can't be null. And the reason for that is this is a library project that is assumed to be used by Kotlin. So if I skip over those, that's why it's kind of just metadata. Uh, again, this file here is what defines the transition between screens and this is used in all the screens. So I just moved this up to the base. This leak watcher is the interface that I told you about that is basically just implemented using leak canary. Um, so this parent component is a is a dagger thingy-majigger. Basically, what this does is defines what can be used in uh, basically things that branch off of the parent. So by default, I kind of needed the screen manager, and this dialog hub is like kind of goes with the single activity architecture thing. It is basically just making sure that your dialogs don't leak and they know how to create themselves and restore themselves when they need to. Leak watcher has been mentioned before. So we'll see this used later, so I won't really touch on it a whole lot now. Um, the screen manager class is basically just the navigator that allows you to pop and push and replace and so on and so forth. Um, this is only useful to the library that is this project. Um, this strings file, like I said earlier, I was just lazy. I moved it from the application to here. Um, some of these certainly don't make sense to put in the base, but uh, you could imagine the ones that might I think pop is certainly one that's used multiple places. Some of them are like third screen dependent. So we probably should organize these better, but I was in a hurry. This is what's generated when creating a new module. Um, so basically every Android module has to have a manifest, and this is the smallest manifest you can possibly have for one of those. And the build.gradle basically just saying what dependencies we have. So this is depending on the library project. 
and some external dependencies and the dialog hub project. Um, that one didn't actually change. So basically most of this is just kind of making those base things that moved and those changes that were made to make it be able to be moved to the base um, relevant for these other screens. So this one's the first screen basically before we were using the main activity component which now just extends the parent component so they're one and the same really no different um, and the rest should mostly just be those same sorts of things like this was moved into the base and the minor changes that needed to happen to make that happen are reflected here so most of these are the same just import changes. So first and second are essentially the same. I won't go over second. The third one is the one that was moved out. Uh, so we can jump there now. So basically all of these files were just moved. Um, so this is a, a dagger thing. Really no change. Just defining a scope. Um, another dagger thing. Just defining the component. Uh, with some minor changes because some of these were moved to that base module. Uh, this shows that it's a new file, but it's really not. <laughs> it's just moved. Um, but again, just some minor changes to reflect the things that got moved to the base. Um, same thing. I don't know why these show as new files rather than moved. Probably because they're so small. Package name. They probably could have left the package name. Um, most of these are pretty simple. Um, this is adding that external dependency into the dagger graph using the dagger module um, so that we can inject that later. Uh, you'll see that's injected in the view and then um, the one thing about the modules rather than in the app. R is not final. The generated R class like you're used to doing R.ID dot whatever isn't those constants aren't final in library projects. So Jake Wharton modified Butterknife and basically generates a different class that's called R2 that is does have those things final and all they do is point to the other thing in the generated code so it just kind of works. So there's like some butter knife changes there just because we moved it to a library rather than the app. And then you can see we use the navigator rather than depending on that second screen directly. Um, and then I just moved the layout file from the app module into the specific one. So I really like this sort of thing. All your resources are kind of grouped to where you're using them. Uh, so that's really nice to have, not like a million layout files in one and trying to figure out which one it is, just like you were talking about earlier with preferences. Like, I always had the same problem with layout files because they were all in one place. Uh, and again, this is just like the minimal manifest that you need for a, for a library project. Um, and that's pretty... The second screen right now does have access to the third screen and it like tells it to push directly so I can show you that code here. I don't know why this is so small. It's kind of frustrating. Yeah, I'm just going to touch. So this is the second view. And basically when you click on go to the third screen button, it just news it up and goes to it. And then it basically just passes in the navigator here. And all the navigator does is essentially pop to itself. Yeah, so... If you want to do this, and say you want to organize by feature, what I do is I take like the most bare bones feature you can think of, like doesn't touch any other part of the application, and just pull it out into another module. Drag and drop all the files, see what compiles and see what doesn't. And basically, what doesn't compile, I just make a, another module. In this case, I called it base. I just drag those things in there with it. And so, like, there's some things that, like, 
for instance, referencing the application class directly, statically, like that's just not going to work, and so you're going to have to find another way. So that's where I was like, all right, create a interface. So that's kind of like not very systematic, but that's how I've found success doing it. <coughs> Yeah, so there's a couple ways to do it. Um, and it really depends on what the business need is. So I'll give you an example. In our app, we have an auth screen. Once you're authenticated, like the happy path is you just go to the dashboard. But there's also a lot of other things that could happen in between, such as you need to accept terms of service. You need to set up a multi-factor authentication. You need to set up a security question, like literally a hundred different things. Well, like setting up a terms of service or accepting a terms of service has nothing to do with setting up a multi-factor authentication. So all of those things are in different modules. So it's not just like one gargantuan login module that knows how to do everything. So basically what I did is I created an interface that's called a login flow. And basically, the order that these happen in can be figured out up front. So basically, there's just a single method on this flow that's like, go to next screen. And so basically, this module, all it is, is one class. It's an interface that has a method that says, go to next screen. And so all of the modules, like terms of service, multi-factor authentication, depend on that. And all they do is say, go to next screen. Um, so, like, Terms of Service knows how to talk to multi-factor authentication because, you know, they're one after the other, but they don't directly know about it. All it knows is that I'm done, go to the next thing. So if you truly needed to, like, pass data or pass a listener or something like that, you could use dagger scopes and basically, we've also done this. Basically, we have like a flow for paying someone, transferring money or whatever. And like you have to aggregate a bunch of data and we do it in a wizard. So like you might have to select the account that you're going to transfer from, the person you're going to transfer to, the date that's going to be transferred, so on and so forth. All this data, it's done in the flow and you kind of have to pass it along. Well, we just created another dagger scope that lives basically underneath all of those screens. And we just use that to house data or pass information between screens, et cetera. So you could do it directly. You could do it using like different scoping mechanisms or global state. You know, choose your poison. You said this is on part of one of your open source projects? Yeah, I can I can post links to the branches. Um, I haven't merged it because primarily I haven't tested to make sure that all this uh, Android Gradle plugin 3.0 stuff makes the publishing process of these potentially breaking. And I don't want to like prevent myself from being able to publish an update. So I could probably test that and merge it, but I'll just post the links to the branches for now. Um, so yeah, there's, I suppose kind of like to recap, there's a ton of like nitty gritty technical things that you could or choose a different way to do. But like the main reason why we do this is like I barely task like touched on, right? Like instant apps or testing or just like general architecture things that are all like very beneficial. So like Certainly there's some technical things that like make me want to shy away because it took me a long time to like figure out all these little pieces to make this actually work. Um, but once you're there, it makes testing these things like for instance, the terms of service page doesn't care anything about what's before it or anything about what's after it. All it knows is, hey, this user accepted terms of service. So you can test in isolation. Um, and that's really the main benefit to doing this. Uh, so, that being said, I have some links to some things, and I will 
post slides and links to code at the meetup page. And unless you guys have anything else, that's all I have. Thanks, Jake.